It's a little bit like playing football. So like when you're in the infantry, you're playing high school football. So you're out there every Friday night, like, you know, love of the game. It's gritty. Your pads kind of stink. They're not so good. You know, you're a little bit sloppy, but you know, high school football. Then like I go over to Marine Special Operations, Raider Battalion. Now it's like I'm playing, you know, division one ball. We've got like nice slick pads. We're like maybe sponsored by Nike. And every now and again, one of our games is on TV. You know, then I went over to the agency. It's like an NFL. I mean, you got your own locker, like you're flying private, you know, around to, to go to the games and you're playing against like the absolute toughest teams out there but with the best players on your team. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit and I served war zone tours as an army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15 year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we hear another set of combat stories from Elliot Ackerman, a decorated Marine infantry officer, special operations operator, CIA paramilitary officer, Silver Star and Purple Heart recipient, and best-selling author. As many will recall, Elliot was our first guest on Combat Story, long before we ever did video interviews. That first interview remains one of my favorites and covers an incredible inside look at his role as a platoon leader in Fallujah 2 in 2004 and the true grit and determination required. In this second interview, we pick up where we left off from round one, as Elliot describes being one of the first members of Marine Special Operations Command and his subsequent deployments with the unit. We also dive into his national best-selling book, Places and Names, subtitle On War, Revolution, and Returning, where Elliot describes revisiting both in mind and body his combat experiences. It's a fantastic read, And in the interview, he shares moments from the book that include returning to the very buildings he fought from in Fallujah years earlier, and another experience having an unthinkable meal with a former Al-Qaeda in Iraq leader as they shared their memories on the front lines fighting against each other. Elliot is a special Marine who survived five deployments and fought at the very highest levels. I hope you enjoy this second combat story with Elliot as much as I did. Elliot, thanks for taking the time to share your story a second time with us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ryan. So this is uh, three and a half years, I think, since the last time, and you were one of the first people I ever interviewed. And I I still, to this day, don't know why the hell you said yes to that first interview, but I'm so glad you did. Um, I, I found it to be really insightful, and I wasn't sure what it would be like interviewing vets. And your description of what happened in Fallujah and the evolution of you as an officer just hit a hit a nerve with me and I've just not stopped since. So I just wanted to say a huge thank you for being a guinea pig when you didn't have to. You have a lot of name recognition and I did not. So thanks so much, man. Oh man, thank you. I thought we had a lot of fun talking those many years ago. I can't believe it was three and a half years ago. I know, yeah. And I, I only just released it last year for people who, who have listened to this show more often. Like I interviewed you then when I was at the agency, I couldn't release it until I got out. So I was able to re- release it last year, but it is hard to believe three and a half years. Um, so much has gone on for you, uh, multiple books, and I just want to catch people up briefly before we dive into this, this session and anybody can go back and listen to that first interview. Surprisingly, like 20 or 30,000 people wanted to hear you and I talk, which is great. I'm sure we'll get even more this time, but just in a nutshell and correct me if I'm off here, Elliot, for people to get the recap, like we talked about you growing up, going to Tufts, went into the Marine Corps, you know, you did ROTC infantry right into Fallujah. And we, we, we spent a lot of time on that fight in Fallujah. And it was super interesting to hear. And then you get the Silver Star, Purple Heart. We never touched on your MARSOC time, uh, the special ops side. So I, I wanted to spend some time there. And then you go on to write five novels. You're writing for all kinds of publications, White House fellow, making me feel like I don't do anything myself. So so much to cover, but we're going to pick up from the post Fallujah time, I think would be appropriate if that's all right with you. Yeah, great. Perfect. Uh, Go ahead. What do you want to know? Yep. yep. So I, I, what I wanted to do was if we, if we could start with you deciding to come out of the conventional side of the Marine Corps and go into the special ops, right? You, you'd gone through Fallujah. I don't know if you did another deployment after that on the conventional side, but what was the, the decision there for you? moving over onto the special ops world. So it had always been an ambition of mine to get over to special operations. And I had actually, um, 
before I even was commissioned as a lieutenant, um, I got a five-year bachelor's master's degree uh, at the Fletcher School at Tufts. So I was like in the ROTC program on a four-year commissioning track into the military. And then my junior year of college, I get accepted in this program where it was basically like, you get a, a two-year master's degree, but by only adding on one year. So it was like your senior year counted towards your master's, and then you do this fifth year. And then you would get your bachelor's degree and your master's degree at the exact same time. I only bring that up because it's great for me because it turned out to be like this total boondoggle in which the Marine Corps could not commission me because I didn't have a bachelor's degree. I would get the master's degree at the same time. And because I didn't have a bachelor's degree, I was not commissionable. So it allowed me to immediately get a master's. I bring that up with regards to going into special operations because it left me in this weird position where I had like this free summer. And I was, you know, I had a military ID because I was an ROTC midshipman. So I was, you know, in the military, um, but they didn't have anything for me to do that summer. And I had this great captain who's sort of, uh, he was the Marine officer instructor. So in charge of all of the ROTC students heading to the Marines, uh, he was a old uh, CH-46 pilot. Just, I mean, he and I are still friends, a uh, great guy. And um, he basically said, he said, listen, if you want to, if you can talk your way into any school in the U.S. military, like, all right, you no cost orders to go to that school. I mean, like, we won't pay for it, but we'll give you, but we'll give you a piece of paper so you'll officially be on orders. Uh, and I managed to uh, kind of just through luck, talk my way through, I talked my way into jump school, dive school, and the amphibious reconnaissance school, um, kind of over this like just jam packed kind of very frankly, like really punishing summer of just getting wailed on in all these schools. But um, so when I went to the Marine Corps, I had, you know, I'd been through those schools, went into the infantry, and then just very clearly knew I wanted to go into special operations uh, once I got out of the infantry. And it was an interesting time because that was it. So this was in, uh, in 2006, Don Rumsfeld was the Secretary of Defense. And, you know, there was a real focus now on U.S. Special Operations Command, Special Operations, and growing that capability. And for the longest time, the Marine Corps had no U.S. SOCOM component. Uh, and so in 2006, by mandate of Don Rumsfeld, because neither the commandant nor the head of U.S. SOCOM actually wanted Marines in Special Operations Command, he said, no, there will be a Marine component command. It will be called MARSOC. And it was founded in uh, 2006. And I showed up there like January of 2007 with sort of the first group of guys who were doing this. And what they were basically doing um, was sort of like how the, you know, the Navy SEALs were built out of the UDTs, the underwater demolition teams in World War II. They were building what are now the Marine Raiders out of the Marines force reconnaissance community. So I was sort of going into a command that until very recently had been second force reconnaissance company. And I was showing up and now it was going to be, you know, at first they called it second Marine special operations battalion and then it became second Marine Raider battalion. Um, so that was sort of my path there. So I always knew that's where I wanted to go and um, and arrived at sort of an interesting time. It was sort of like we were, you know, racing the race car around the track while we were like still trying to put the wheels on and paint it. What, what's the difference between, if there is one, when you, when you say like force recon and then MARSOC, are they synonymous? Are they under the same command? Yeah. I, I, I don't want to get, you know, just for listeners, I don't know how, how interested people are because it gets a little like technical. So they're going to be interested. Okay. If you're interested. Yeah. So, so for the yeah. longest time, you know, you had, you had the Marine reconnaissance community. And so when I said, I went through like our training course dive school, the one, the big one I went through was um, the amphibious reconnaissance school. And that's a 10, was a 10 week program in Fort Story, Virginia. And uh, I was just a, a total haze ex. Um, and interestingly enough, to show you kind of what of a small world it is, if, you know, you really meet people. I mean, folks always said this to me, but it's really proved to be profound in my life. You meet people of those ages and like they wind up being people you're just married up with for your whole life uh, and have a huge impact on me. So I show up, the way I get to amphibious reconnaissance school is I'm talking about the Marine officer instructor, this captain who's a helicopter pilot, was like a great guy, gives me no cost orders. Well, I was at Tufts. The Marine officer instructor at Holy Cross, which was down the road from us, was this guy named Phil Zeman, great guy, who was a former second force guy. And so I went to him at the time, I was like, hey, I've got this free summer. And I was like, I really wanna to go to ranger school. And he's like, yeah, I don't go to ranger school. Like that's, that's, that's useless. He's like, you, what you need to do is go to the amphibious reconnaissance school because that will give you this MOS. And even though actually they didn't give officers the MOS, so it only it was an enlisted MOS. But be like, you know, that's the thing that you that makes you a reconnaissance marine. And he said, 
it's all right. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can work a deal with you because the guy who's the uh, assistant officer in charge down there is this captain. And he and I are buddies from second force. And his name is Doug Zembeck. And um, Doug Zembeck is like anyone in Marine service. Like Doug is, you know, Doug was, Doug was killed. He was a detailee for CIA when he was killed, but he's his legend in the reconnaissance community. And just frankly, just in the Marine Corps, uh, I'm going to notice the lion of Fallujah, but, you know, I show up like a snot-nosed midshipman. This is sort of like, you know, no one's really been to war yet. And Doug is like the hulking guy at the Amphibious Reconnaissance School. And he's second in command. I'll never forget the first night I got there, we went out. We went out like we were allowed. Like we just kind of checked in. We've been there like three or four days. And they let us out like on a pass one night to go out to dinner. And so we went out. It was like the officers and NCOs were going to go out. We we're going to have a strategy session of how we were going to lead our class through this, you know, hellacious course we know we were going into. And we're sitting at this restaurant, and because I was a midshipman, you know, I was like a kind of a nominally an officer. And so I'm sitting there, and um, uh, and we see at like the far table, Doug and what then be his then you know she became his wife Pam. I'm like, oh hey hey, you know, let's let's order him. Sort of a drink. So like send over a drink to him. We're like, you know, hey, like, hey, hey, sir, you know, good to see you. And as he's walking out with Pam, he brings over, he orders up a round of Jaeger shots. And in the middle of the room, he go, he lifts up his shot of Jaeger and he goes, he's like, Recon, men wanna wanna be us, women wanna be with us. And like does this shot and walks out the door. And you're just like, who is this guy? Uh, and if anyone who knew him would tell you, like, you know, that was sort of part of his charm. Like he, you know, he would say kind of this outrageous, like he'd always be talking about like, you know, brothers, if we don't make it, we'll want, we'll see you in Valhalla. And like, like that was just sort of his MO. And if anyone else said it, it would sound like ridiculous and contrived and cheesy, but like you love being around him because like he, you know, he believed it. And, you know, when you were with him, like you believed it too. And when you're, you know, in the profession of arms, like you need to believe sometimes because there's certainly lots of things that can make you cynical. So anyway, I only brought it up. So I kind of, I'd gone through that course. I always knew that's what I wanted to do. One of the other officers in that course, um, who's still at the agency, he had a very distinguished kind of Marine uh, career, it was really one of the intellectual, he was a second force recon platoon commander. It was one of the real intellectual plank holders over at MARSOC, meaning when he came back from doing a couple of deployments in Iraq, with second force reconnaissance, he then comes over to Marsoc and, you know, was setting up like the table of organization. It was one of the guys they really relied upon. He then left and went over to the agency as a paramilitary guy. He's, he's still there and is, and is very senior now. Um, but, you know, he was like two racks down from me. I mean, he's one of my best friends and, you know, I see him all the time now, but I just bring that up because, you know, you, you, I never would have in that moment guessed sort of how, profound those relationships would have would be for me throughout my life um and it was like and also frankly like it just like felt like a real privilege to like get a b with those guys at yeah. such a kind of nascent stage of our um of our developments but i bring him up because when i was he was always my marine big brother and i was always like hey man when i come back when i finish at 1a you know i really want to come over i want to come over to second force come over to second force and then this stuff happened in 2006 and second force now becomes sort of MARSOC, second Raider battalion. And when I showed up, there was a lot of um, organizationally, a lot of upheaval uh, of like, what is the mission? Uh, what is the niche that Marine special operators are going to fill? You know, are you guys gonna be a strike unit? Are you gonna be doing like forward internal defense and unconventional warfare like ODAs? Like, what, mm -hmm. what is your job, Marines? Like, why do we, you know, and it's sort of, it's, it's something if you, you know, if you are a Marine that kind of always, it's like in the Marine DNA, like, hey, why the hell do you guys exist? So I said, I mean, you know, America doesn't need a Marine Corps. America wants a Marine Corps. And I think that was very much the experience of being in MARSOC was we sort of had to pave our own way because we were kind of our own niche thing. Uh, and Got so it. that deployment in Marine Special Operations was, yes, it was about being on a combat deployment. And, we, and we, yes, we very much had our, mission in Afghanistan, you know, and we were partnered with an Afghan commando battalion. Um, and we wound up, you know, we deployed for the first time in this reorganized configuration, almost kind of like a special forces ODA, no, t uh, no company of uh, Marine special operators had done that before. Like, we were the first to deploy in what's called MSOTs, Marine special operations to teams, which is still a configuration today. Um, but so we had that Afghan mission, sorry, we had that Afghan mission, but then simultaneously, we sort of had this like macro organizational mission, like don't screw it up, because if you screw it up, like, you know, there are bigger, 
bigger Marsoc equities involved. And you guys really need yeah. to on this. That's tough. Hey, so I, I want to get into that combat, but I, I want to talk just briefly. There is a, there is something in places and names that I want to read. And I think it's back to that, to uh, the amphibious recon school where you describe somebody helping you during the process, during a stalking exercise. Yeah. It, so I think it's, it's that part. And the quote is you, you say, my my career and life might have taken a different course if he hadn't taken care of me that day in the sun. And the way you, did, uh, if, if you could provide context for that story, I thought it was excellent in the book and it sounds like it had a profound impact on the direction you went. I just couldn't tell if it was at that school or something later. No, that was at the Amphibious Reconnaissance School and it was just sort of one of these days and actually it seemed like a sort of benign day uh, where we were doing a stalking exercise. So meaning we were like kind of all wearing ghillie suits. And the idea was, you know, you've sort of seen the scene. There's an instructor like in the back of a Humvee with binoculars out and all the students are fanned out in the field and you need to like stock up to a certain point without them seeing you. And, and so, you know, I'm like lying there and it's, it's you know, Virginia in uh, probably that point it was like late July, early August. And I'm like, you know, creeping in the hot sun. And the mistake I made was, you know, it's all very sandy there. And so I kind of like was stalking in the low ground where the underbrush was just all sand and you get higher, it was more kind of dirt and grass. So all sand, that sand had been baking. So you're like crawling on this just, you know, hot sand and we were out there for like, you know, I don't know, two or three hours. And by the end of this thing, when it was sort of finally all over and they called the exercise, I stood up and I was out of water. And the policy of the school was if you at any point went down for heat, like you were a heat casualty, overheated, passed out, they would, they would take you out of the class because they're like, you know, cause, because once you pass out for heat, you become susceptible to it happening again. And they're like, it's too dangerous. We can't have you in the course anymore. And I, I was, I was, I was basically at that point, a heat casualty. Like I could barely walk. And my, my buddy, the one I mentioned, who was sort of always my Marine big brother and, you know, is now at the agency, like he saw it immediately and grabbed me before any of the instructors could get him a business, like dragged me over underneath the tree, like dumped water on my face, kind of smacked me a few times you know, and like got me up and got me on the truck and, you know, anyone came close, like, he's fine, you know, leave him alone. And like gave me the 15 minutes to sort of get, just get it together. So I was not a heat casualty. And I've just thought, yeah, I've often thought bad on that, back on that. Like, you know, what if he hadn't done that for me? And I'd washed out of that course because I was a heat casualty. Um, my, you know, that aspect of my professional life could have gone in a different direction. Um, so, you know, yeah, these little things really, they really matter. Yeah, that's that's a cool story. It's really told so well in the book. So as we jump forward, then, Elliot, to back when you're you're in Marsoc, you're deploying to Afghanistan. Could you, you know, nothing classified, obviously, but just any what was kind of the configuration that you used? You mentioned it's similar to an ODA configuration, uh, but it's the first time and it's kind of th this MSOT model. So what, what did the configuration look like? And then what was kind of like a regular mission set you would run there? And one of the, you know, so one of the interesting things was like Marine Special Operations, at least then it's like, a, it's a very small community. Everybody knows, you know, everybody knows each other. And um, I only bring that up because, so we were a hotel company. So hotel company was the third company of Marine Special Operators to deploy. The first one, Fox Company, had, had a very controversial and hard deployment. Uh, and I don't want to get into everything that happened, but there was like a big investigation. Uh, I've always kind of, my read on this has always been, frankly, that they deployed into Afghanistan. They had a, they didn't have a great relationship with the, uh, the, uh, special operation task force there, the siege of Sotif, um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and I'm not classing, you know, blame either way. I wasn't there, but, um, but then there was sort of like an incident where the Taliban said, oh, they killed all these civilians. And the siege of Sotif was very quick to be like, we wash our hands of them. We don't like them. And, and they, you know, got, it was very controversial. And it was really sort of an existential moment from our song. Um, and I say it's small because the one of the platoon commanders in that, in Fox Company, that first company, was like a very good friend of mine, like an exceptional Marine officer. He'd actually been shot through the, he was in my, in 1-8 in my infantry battalion. Uh, he was in Bravo Company. I was an Alpha Company. He was a first lieutenant when I was a second lieutenant. Uh, and he'd been, you know, shot through the femur in Fallujah, leading his Marines, had like rehabbed himself, had then like gone nine months later through the amphibious reconnaissance school and passed it with like a recently shot femur. I mean, he's, you know, a tough dude, makes it through the course, great Marine. And, you know, there's just this horrible nightmare of a deployment. So we put, I only bring that up because like that's sort of the context in which we were operating. 
So when they'd gone out, their organization for the first two Marine Special Operations companies, it was sort of almost like, um, like kind of the Black Hawk Downs. We were talking about that earlier, you know, uh, Task Force Ranger kind of model where you have like this platoon of Delta operators and they have a trailer platoon of Rangers with them. And that is like a big strike unit. And so the idea was that you would have this like platoon of around 40, what used to be force recon Marines or now Marine special operators were older, you know, direct action operators that you would have sort of a, a regular Marine infantry platoon called the trailer platoon. And those would not be recon Marines, uh, but eventually they would feed into the, the direct action platoon. And MARSOC deployed forward with that concept. And the only problem was that like the siege of set of commanders in Afghanistan are like, we don't need a big Marine strike unit. Like we need ODAs. And when they came to us, they basically said, okay, you guys are going to deploy in the new configuration. We're just going to get rid of this trailer platoon altogether. And we're going to take that 40 man, it was called the Dasser platoon, direct action, special reconnaissance platoon. And we're just going to chop it into thirds. And those third, each third will be a Marine special operations team of 14 Marines. So basically two four man, uh, two four man elements, a team sergeant and uh, a team leader. And so when I originally came to MARSOC, I was young, I was a first lieutenant uh, out of the infantry, I wasn't a captain yet. And they assigned me to go right out the door um, as the trailer platoon commander. And actually another friend of mine was the Dasser platoon commander who was a very senior captain. Uh, and then they chopped it all up. And then I wound up you know, getting one of the Marine Special Operations teams when we went to Afghanistan, basically with an ODA mission. Jeez. And then, and you guys, I think in the book, you're in Paktika, is that right? In RC East? No. So I was with, I was, I was in Paktika when I was with the agency. Got it. All right. Sorry. So I mixed, where did you deploy for that first time? Uh, so we were in, we were in uh, Herat province at a play. We were, our team was based in Shindan airfield, which is right on the border between Herat and Farah provinces in Western Afghanistan. Okay. Got it. And then if you can take us through, like, I'm sure you ran tons of missions. Is there one in particular that comes to mind that was just high intensity, dangerous? You know, last time we talked, we talked about this, this gauntlet in Fallujah. Was there another time that even came close to that for you when you were on the MARSOC side? Um, yeah, you know, there was a, I mean, there were a couple, our, our mission basically when we got there was they were standing up these commando battalions from the Afghan National Army. They were basically going to be the Afghan kind of equivalent of a ranger battalion, and they were going to be geographically situated. So we were partnering up with the 207th Afghan Commando Battalion, which was going to be RC West's strike unit for the Afghan National Army. So we met them in Kabul, finished their training course with them, which was like for three weeks, and then we flew them all the way out to Shindan and got them set up up there. And so it was our team. Each commando battalion has two ODAs attached to it. And so it was our team and this one ODA from seventh group, great guys. And we knew as a team too, like our imperative was, you know, we needed to show that we would work great with an ODA. And we were very fortunate and that like the guys on the ODA, I mean, I'm still some, some great friends of mine. were just like a great ODA. Like we were very lucky. Like everybody got along great. Um, and I would actually say sort of one of the, things that bonded us together very quickly is I think about two weeks after that ODA showed up, because we, we were in country before they were, um, our sister team, our sister Marine team, which was down in Farah in the South, got into a very big firefight, call, had to call us and a company of commandos down to do the quick reaction force for them. So we wind up driving like all night to get down to them. We drive down. Uh, we had like a little bits of troops in contact coming down there. And we could see like flares going off at night as the Taliban were kind of marking our, you know, noting our progress towards this town. We show up in the middle of the night, you know, our sister team's like, hey, we've been in, you know, they've been in this like running gun fight all day long in this town uh, outside of another town called Shewan. And uh, the next morning, like, hey, we're all going to go in the town. We're going to clear this town out. So inevitably, the next morning, we go in to clear out the town. And of course, everyone's melted away and there's nobody in the town anymore. All the Taliban have left. So we're kind of packing things up. They're going to go back to their fire base, which was like sort of further to the west. And we were going to go kind of east, northeast, back to our fire base. And there was sort of like one road through the main town of Shawan. And I was like, well, and we're all exhausted. Like nobody slept. Like, well, we can go through the road or we can try to go off road. If we go off road, it's like really rough. We're probably going to bust up our trucks. You know, it's going to take like another four or five hours. Like, 
you know, like, all right, you know, we're going to go through the town. So long story short, we basically, you know, we go through the town, we get into a huge ambush. Um, I remember right as we're going into the town, this like, I mean, it was like something out of a, almost like a gangster film. There was this water truck and I was, I think I was like, I was like third vehicle back and it was like a 15 vehicle convoy. And this truck like kind of jackknifes across the road and it's making like this really awkward three point turn as we're like going into town, but we're sort of like, we're kind of committed at this point. And like, oh, we can't turn the convoy around. Like, uh, you know, all the hairs in the back of your neck go up. And then the truck moves. We drive maybe, you know, 100 yards in. And then, you know, just sort of RPGs from both sides. And we're in the middle of this ambush. We're, you know, drive, drive, drive. You know, you, you know, you, as you learn, you, you know, in an ambush, you push through the kill zone. And so we push through the kill zone. We get out. And, um, you know, we've got uh, one of the guys from the ODA, a guy named Dave Nunez, um, was, was basically – his truck had gotten hit. He was trapped in the truck. Um, truck was on fire. He died. Uh, all of our trucks come limping out of this town and we were just totally, um, you know, just really, really in bad shape. And, uh, we get out, you know, we get out of town. We kind of regroup. We're trying to get a head count. Cause I'm gonna listen, like, cause it takes a while to figure that out. Like I'm, I'm telling you, Oh, we lost, you know, like I didn't know in that moment that we lost it. You know, I, all I see is like, we pushed through the kill zone. Okay. I'm out of the kill zone. You know who we got. I'm checking in with my team sergeant, Willie, like, you know, what was it looking like back there? I don't know. All our trucks are through, but seven, three, two, six is still back there. And we're trying to get, you know, so time passes. We figure, we basically figure out, okay, we've got like, it was three trucks had been just destroyed and everyone's out. We had like a you know, number of about 12 wounded guys, but Dave's, you know, still back there. Um, and I remember at that point, like every truck was basically, except for like one or two was towing another truck. And I'm linked up with my team leader. I'm like, you know, what do we do about, you know, how do we get Dave? We got to get Dave's body out of here. Like, what do we do? And, um, you know, you see in movies and people talk about stuff like, like, you know, leave no man behind, you know, you know what you do, but, I'll tell you when you're when you're there, and I know clear as day, I've got two trucks that aren't towing another truck. He's dead. Like, do we go back in there? And I know if I send these two trucks in there, you know, we're probably gonna get killed doing that for a body. Like those are tough, tough decisions, you know, and like what do you do uh in you know in a spot like that? So uh, you know, long story short, after like much deliberations and arguments and how do we do this? And, uh, you know, the other team got out of their fob because they were actually kind of, you know, they were at full strength. And that night went in and got Dave's body out. Um, but I just tell this story because I think so many, many times in like training, or at least how I was given to me in training, people would just sort of say things like, and you know, you never leave a man behind. I'm like, oh yeah, you never leave a man behind. Of course, you never leave a man behind. You know, live, dead, you never leave a behind. It's like, well, you know, that, 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 that gets pretty gnarly in practice. Like, I, I don't know about you. Like I'll say for myself, like if I was dead and like, I'm gone, I wouldn't want three of my buddies to no. lose their life to get my body. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I myself yeah. plan on being cremated. Somewhere, so I don't really care, you know, and I would like them to have a life. So it's, you know, like this is real stuff that I don't think it's talked about enough. Um, and if you ever get in a fight where you're really taking casualties, I mean, like you're seeing like platoons getting wiped out and stuff like that, you know, that calculation starts getting really, really fraught. And I think that um, uh, I just I just think that, you know, we, we do ourselves a disservice when we kind of roll out these these very heavy platitudes that maybe make us feel good about ourselves. We don't really analyze them uh, as to what their what their true moral implications are. Um, I'll just make kind of one other point on that. Um, so I have, you know, I have four kids now. I have, uh, you know, I have two of my own, I have two, I have two stepsons. And I look back at that time, uh, my time in Iraq and my time in Afghanistan, my very last deployment in Afghanistan, I'd had my daughter. Um, so I was a father, but I look at the guys I was with, like my team sergeants, some of the more senior NCOs who I knew, you know, at the time, like I, you know, I knew they had kids who were, you know, seven years old, six years old, eight years old. And I look back now, I'm like, how the fuck were you doing the stuff that we were doing with three kids at home? Like, how the fuck did you do that? Like, how did you, oh my God. And 
Because I imagine now taking the risk that I know those guys were taking in my current set of circumstances. I'm just like in awe, total awe of those guys that they were able to, you know, compartmentalize enough. Because listen, I like I'm telling these stories about Afghanistan. Like when this stuff was going down, I was like, you know, I was 28. I had a girlfriend. You know, my, right. parents, my parents love me, I know. And they would have been heartbroken if anything had ever happened to me. But like, you know, there aren't little kids involved. Uh, and so I, you know, it, it's just, I look back at, I look back at, um, that time and I realized, my God, there was so much going on beneath the surface with all these guys. I was so close to, you know, cause they had a family at home that I just, you know, just cause I wasn't a father. I didn't have a family. I couldn't imagine at the time. And now I can. And like my jaw just drops. So man, that, that's a great story. There, there's so much that I would just like to, to ask about there. I think, the first one is when you were kind of deliberating, arguing with people about going back in for uh, David, was it, were you the senior officer there? It, although you you said you were first lieutenant, I don't know if at the time you were captain, was this like your call to make at the time? Yeah, so it's interesting. It gets in a sort of group, you know, I, I, I bring this up not because I think there's a right or wrong answer, just because, I don't know, maybe if you're listening, it's, you know, and you have a tie with the military to make you think about it. So it's interesting because we were split. We were at two teams and um, my, the team leader and I, our arrangements, like we would basically just switch missions. Who was the mission commander? You know, who's like kind of name was on the dotted line and ultimately had to call the ball. Um, and, you know, you, nine times out of 10 kind of decisions are made collegially. You know, no one's like, this is how it's going to be because you don't really need to be that way. Everyone knows what the plan is. But I was just through coincidence, the mission commander on that one. But it was his guy who was back there. And so, um, so I, I deferred to him. I was like, what do you think, what do you want to do? And he's like, I know Dave, I'll be like, you know, we got to, we're not going to take these two trucks and just go screaming back into Shawan because we're going to get a bunch of guys killed doing that. It doesn't make any sense. You know, just stop a beat. What was interesting was I had a, I had a boss at that time who I didn't really see eye to eye with. And he was actually in Bagram. Dave called his boss, who was an army lieutenant colonel, and I called my boss. This is all on satellite iridium, you know, like, you know, this is on basically the sat radio. Yeah. And Dave, Dave's boss was great. He's like, understood. That's how you're seeing it. We're going to figure out how to, how to do this. Hold what you got. Take care of your guys. You know, we're going to figure this out. I, I understand what you're telling me. We don't want to see a whole bunch of more, you know, more and more guys getting killed today. Over this, we're going to figure out this problem, but we're not going to do it in a bonehead way. And my boss was like singing a very, very different tune, you know, kind of like, uh, hey, 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 what the hell's wrong with you? Get your ass back in there. I don't care. You know, da, da, da. And so I was sort of looking at him like, this is what I'm hearing we have to do. This is what your boss is saying we have to do. You know, I think this is, you know, this is making more sense to me right now. But it was not, I only found because it was not an uncontentious um, decision. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's complex and it, it, you know, it gets, and it gets very emotional and it's, and it's, and it's, uh, and it's messy. And I would be lying to you if I told you like to this day, I don't look back and think about it. You know what I mean? And say, Oh, you know, like maybe we should have just rolled the dice and said, Hey, you know, maybe we could have, maybe we could have, you know, maybe we could have like beat death one more time and gone in and got him in that and we would have been okay. You know, like who knows, but you know, it's, it's tough. It's why I, why I wind up writing about a lot of this stuff. Cause you know, you yeah. just keep asking all those questions over and over and over again, you know, and ultimately, you know, you know, we got Dave's body out of there and you know, and it was another team that did it, you know, it wasn't us, his, you know, his team that was able to do it. And I know that for a lot of us, you know, that's been something that we've felt disappointed about. Um, but at the same time too, there, you know, no one else got killed that day. So yeah, feel good about that. So it's, you know, it's, this, this stuff's complicated. And I agree entirely with what you were saying about when they teach you to make decisions. I, I distinctly remember back in ROTC, like the, when they try to pose a, you're going to have to make tough decisions like this. It's never something like what you just described. Like that's a, a tough decision, right? <laughs> yeah. Like you have to overrule a friend of yours who you've been fighting with. You got a boss, you, you got like two Lieutenant Colonels tell her, you know, like senior it's officers things, you know, and, it's, uh, and you probably had a platoon Sergeant or whatever it was, the equivalent who had their own opinion. That's yeah. hard as hell. And, and I'll tell you the one thing, you you know, like people ask me why I went in the military and I kind of always went in because I was like, you know, I feel like there, there might be like some, at some point and I feel like, you know, I'm a, a guy, I got to do 
out from this country. Like I like to, I would like to feel like I made a contribution to making, you know, some good decisions on behalf of guys who had to serve under me. Um, and I can look back in my career and I can really think of a few key times where I was like, you know, it's like, hey, call the ball, Ackerman. And I'm because I'm like on the radio. And this is one of those times or times I've alluded to where like I'm having a conversation on the radio, like a very intense conversation. And I'm, you know, and I'm sort of like staring at whatever's like right in front of me. And then like, I'll kind of look up out of my peripheral vision and I'll see that there's like five, six, 10 guys all from the team or the platoon kind of, I can see eavesdropping because they know, you know, they like, you know, like they're not dumb. They know like, Hey, yeah, what's the skipper doing? Oh, he's on the phone with, you know, the task force. Oh yeah. Are we going in? Uh, that's what he's talking about. Oh, and if we're going in, you know, you know, we might get schwacked or, you know, like in Fallujah, I talked about on your other show, like, you know, I remember being on the radio when we were pinned down in a house and my company commander, who was a great company commander, you know, was getting orders from hire. Like, Hey, you guys got to get out of that house. And I'm on the radio going, we're totally pinned down. If we go out the front door of this house, like we're going to get smoked. And he's like, I understand, like you got to go. And I remember going back and forth with him on this. I mean, you know, for like, I mean, it was probably in all told three minutes, but you know, looking up and seeing like every guy who wasn't like actively in the firefight that moment was like, oh, like, what are we doing? Are we actually going to do this? Um, and you have that's having the sense that like, as goes your conversation and your ability to convey kind of the reality of the situation to your senior commanders, you know, that that will kind of dictate your fate and the fate of everyone around you. So um, I would say that kind of incident in Shawan was also one of those incidents. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that that series of radio exchanges. And I remember, yes, the pressure of my buddy who was the team leader and, you know, talking it over with my team sergeant quickly. But the thing I remember the most was kind of catching the odd glances of the guys on the team, you know, who are kind of wondering, you know, all right, what are we what are we about to go do? Yeah. It, that's like truly when their lives depend on what what couple sentences you have to say and what you hear on a radio. It's crazy. Listen, and you just have the like, and you just have the profound sense of like, man, you know, I hope I'm not a bozo because these guys, yeah, really I got to do this right. You need not to be a dumbass right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so true. All right. I have one other question here. Cause you brought up, you know, you, so you deployed without children and then again with a kid, right? So yeah. The first time I deployed, I had a six month old son. So I never had the other way, but I would imagine the way you described it is true. Is there any, did you, did you, um, like what was different for you when you had a child going into combat? Like, how did you approach things differently? Did you make decisions differently? Was there a noticeable difference or was it just heavier burden afterwards? I would say I didn't notice it was my, it was my last deployment with the agency. And I would not say there was a huge noticeable difference only because my daughter was so young. Um, she was like, two and a half months when I, when I yeah. and um, I know your father, you know, my same daughter, she turns 11 now uh, this summer. And the, the depth of a relationship I have with her now is so much profoundly deeper than when she was, you know, just like the littlest infant. She was in some respects for me, still like this abstraction, like, you know, yes, I understand that I'm a father now, but you know, you know, I've got a little infant and okay, it's great. But you know, now my daughter and I have, you know, She's my like 11 year old daughter. So, so for me, that sense of like, just sort of this awe that I sense of the, the guys I knew who were there with real families has only deepened as I've come to understand what it means to be a father to my own children. Um, you know, that being said, I do think even at that early stage, I started to ask myself questions when I was going in and out of Afghanistan. Like, you know, why am I here? And uh, I mean, me, like just at a very personal level, like, yeah. why are you coming here? You know, why are you still doing this work? You know, what, what, what's your reason? And if you were to die here, would you, would you be okay with that? Um, you know, like we talked about like Doug Zembeck, you know, yeah. um, when he, you know, when he died, it really, I think hurt and really profoundly affected a lot of people. I mean, it really, you know, I would say kind of caused my knees to buckle a little bit, uh, cause he was just such a Titan. Um, but there was sort of, I think, amongst many of us who knew him well, what was acted as a little bit of a sal was we all said, I think this was true, said, you know, but like, if you told Doug, this was how it was going to end. I mean, when he died on a raid, leading troops, going after a senior Al Qaeda guy, I mean, you know, he went down swinging. Uh, if you had told him, hey, man, like, you're not going to make it, but this is how it's going to end for you. Like, there's always this part of like, you know, he would have been all right with it. You know, like he would have 
and like, as I said, like, see you in Valhalla, brother. Like, you know, um, and I don't say that to many, like the huge loss. I mean, he left behind family too. And I know they live with that loss every day, but then, but so, but I looked at myself and I was like, if, you know, at a certain point, I felt like I wouldn't be all right with it if I died here, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. I wouldn't be all right with it. Like, I, why am I coming here? What am I chasing? You know, and if I die chasing this, am I okay with it? And Chris, I was like, you know what? I'm not. Like, I just feel like I've, my time here is done. There's other things I want to do. And I only bring that up because I know having a family did contribute to that. Um, and so just on a token, you know, just me, a personal level, uh, I think it, it, you know, it caused me to just realize, like, I, I you know, I didn't want to, you know, I, you know, I, I, I didn't want to die in Afghanistan. Yeah. And this is a perfect transition to places and names. Um, there, I think for me, you hit on so many points in that book about like the purpose, the mission, re, you know, trying to understand what you were doing. And I mean, I didn't, I didn't do five deployments like you, Elliot, but I still felt let, like I have that today. It was really special the way you set it up. So I want to dive into it. I thought maybe if, if, it, if you think it's appropriate, we'll skip over the agency time because we can't say anything about that. But yeah. if we jump ahead to, I mean, you have a journalism career, right? And I, I feel like there's a big component there with places and names. So I might just ask, could you like, why, why did you leave the agency or that lifestyle to then get into writing. And then I, I'd like to really dive into places and names as part of that. Yeah. Well, I mean, so, so it kind of touches on what we were just talking about with regards to Afghanistan, this idea of like, you know, I don't want to do this forever. And so, um, so I was at the agency, I was working in special operations and I've sort of often likened it to, um, it's kind of like, it's like, it's a little bit like playing football. Okay. So just bear with me. So like when you're in the infantry, right. You're like playing, it's like they put them like you're playing high school football. So you're out there every Friday night, like, you know, love of the game. It's gritty. Your pads kind of stink. They're not so good. You know, you're a little bit sloppy, but you know, high school football. Then like I go over to Marine Special Operations, Raider Battalion. Now it's like I'm playing, you know, division one ball. We've got like nice slick pads. We're like maybe sponsored by Nike. And every now and again, one of our games is on TV. Um, you know, then I went over to the agency. It's like an NFL. I mean, you got your own locker, like you're flying private, you know, around to, to go to the games and you're playing against like the absolute toughest teams out there uh, with, you know, the best players on your team. But at the end of the day, you're playing football. Football is football is football. The rules of the game are largely the same. And I just sort of got to the point where I was like, you know, I asked myself a question, you know, I was like, do I want to play football for the rest of my life? And a lot of people are like, yeah, I want to play football and I love playing professional ball. Like, I, I get that. I just arrived as well. I was like, you know what? I just, I don't want to play football for the rest of my life. Like there's, there's all these other things I want to do. And now, and if I want to do those things, you know, I was 31 when I got out, I've been doing it for eight years. I was like, this is really the time you got to do it. Cause if you, if you hang around too long, you're, you're not really going to be well positioned to go out and do those things. You know, one of the most, you know, I wanted, I wanted to write. Um, and I hadn't written when I was in the military. And so I got out, I took a couple of jobs and, um, you know, I worked on like a political startup for a year. I was a white house fellow for a year, but I was sort of always on the side. I was like basically quietly, quietly kind of writing, uh, um, uh, what was my, what was my first book? Um, and you know, when you get out of the military and when I got out, like I didn't tell anyone I was doing that because to say like, Oh, I want to write. I mean, it's so it's silly. It was like being like, you know, I want to dance, you know, like if you don't mean, you know, I don't mean the show for it. You know what I mean? So I had to just like, you know, get something going. Um, so anyways, uh, I don't know. I mean, you want to hear the story of like my book is or, you know, oh, uh, so I I mean, I would love to, I, what I want to, I want to read something from places and names to kick us off here. Um, and I think as, as I read this, people, I'm interested in what they would think. And then I'm going to kick it over to you here in a second, Elliot. So this is a quote from the book. Uh, somebody in the book is saying this, I train men to fight in explosives, uh, hand to hand combat. I would send them on missions. They were like the point of the spear. I was its handle driving them into the firefight. There's nothing closer than those types of friendships. If you were one of my men, 
and ask me for my shirt, I'd give it to you. So I think anybody listening to this is going to be like, yeah, that's awesome. That's like a Marine right there. There's a special ops guy. But in reality, this is Abu Hassar. And could you tell us who that is and how you ended up encountering this guy? Because this blew my mind in this book. Um, so Abu Hussar is a, you know, former card carrying uh, Al Qaeda in Iraq operative um, who, you know, became, has become a friend of mine. Um, the way I met him. So, you know, I get out, I get out, I'm kind of working on my first book. And then basically a, an acquaintance of mine who was a civilian who spent a lot of time in Afghanistan was basically starting a research organization in Southern Turkey to do work on the Syrian crisis. And this is like in, you know, 2013, kind of right when, right when sort of ISIS is starting to ramp up uh, in Syria. And um, so he basically starts this, this basically it's like a business down there. Um, he and I are friends and he basically says like, hey, if you want to come hang out and, you know, do journalism. And, you know, he basically kind of was like, I'll be, you know, we're happy to be your ticket to ride. Just come along. You know, I wasn't working for him. I was just but like, hang out at our office slash house and interesting stuff is probably going to happen. So, he sets this thing, he and his partner set this thing up and they hired a number of, uh, you know, local hires to, um, to do the work they're doing, which are like surveys, needs assessments, things like that for international NGOs. And so one of the guys they hired was this guy named um, Abed. And Abed was a uh, former democratic activist inside Syria. He fled uh, during the revolution uh, when the government came looking for him to draft him into the army. So he's living in kind of this part of this, the widening Syrian diaspora, very erudite guy, used to work at the British consulate, you know, speaks English, you know, speaks English with a British accent. Um, and so uh, one day I'm like sitting in our sort of house slash office and I'm like making dinner. Uh, and Abed kind of comes driving up in this little like crappy black Peugeot that was like the company car. It's like dust all over the car. He kind of gets out, he walks in and I'm like, I'm like, hey, Abed, like, how was your day, man? He's like, oh, it's like, oh, it was pretty good, pretty good. He's like, you know, I was down in Achakale and Achakale is this like wisp of a town right on the Syrian border. It's actually bisected by a set of railroad tracks. North side of the town is Turkey, the south side of the town is Syria. He's like, oh, I was in Achakale refugee camp today. And he's like, I met this guy. Um, I really think you should meet, or I met this guy and I'm like, oh, well, who's the guy? He's like, well, he, he, I really think you should meet him. He fought for Al Qaeda in Iraq. And I'm like, oh yeah. He's like, yeah, I just feel like the two of you would really get along. And so, you know, so like up for anything. So we kind of set the meeting and the guy was this guy, Abu Hassar, and he had fought for Al Qaeda in Iraq and al Ambar province. And some at the same time that I'd been there and he had run guns and fighters into al Ambar from Eastern Syria in Deir Azur, where he was from. And he was like living in a chocolate refugee camp. And his story was he had been, he'd been doing that. And then towards the end of the U.S. occupation, um, well, actually, he'd been in Iraq doing that. And towards the end of the U.S. occupation, he was on one of his basically smuggling runs. And he goes into, uh, he goes into Al-Ambar to meet with one of the, they called them emirs, is what they would call their commanders in Al-Qaeda. And he meets with one of the emirs and they say, hey, listen, your boss, who was the border emir, the guy who ran the border, we found out that your boss is on the payroll of the Mukhabarat, the Syrian Mukhabarat, their secret police. So sort of either I would start either you take care of your boss, you know, meaning off him, or we're going to take care of you. So I would start drives back across the board. He's like, you know, kind of doesn't know what to do. And literally the next night, the Mukhabarat inside Syria show to his house, they throw him in prison. And he spends about three years in prison. And, um, Early on in the revolution, something that Assad did, which was very astute, is sort of all the activists like Abed were kind of out in the street protesting, was he goes into the prisons where he locked up all these jihadists and he releases all of the jihadists from, from jail because you look much better in the, in the eyes of the international community if you're fighting against jihadists as opposed to fighting against democratic activists. So Assad does that. Abu Assar finds out he's gonna get out of jail and a lot of his kind of jihadist buddies come up to him. It's kind of like, you know, like almost like the movie, The Blues Brothers. You're like, all right, like we're going to get the band back together. This is going to be great. And these guys sort of form like the nucleus of, um, you know, Jabhat al-Nusra and the Islamic State. Like, Abu Assar, are you with us? And he's like, listen, because Assad is letting us out of jail, I imagine like half of you are probably already on the payroll of the Mukhabarat. Uh, I did this once before and I wound up in this prison. Like, I'm done. I'm going to Turkey. 
And so he went to Turkey and that's where I met him. And so the two of us kind of, Abed, my friend Abed set this whole thing up for us. Just, just, you know, like, Hey, let's go have a cup of coffee and you guys can talk about the war. But sort of the tricky thing was, I was like, well, what do you want to do, Abed? You want to like tell him a former Marine special operator, like wants to have a cup of tea with him. And we're like, yeah, it's probably like, let's, let's see how it goes before you kind of, you know, lay that on him. And so we originally kind of set up the meeting. We just said, Hey, he said, hey, there's this American. He'd been a journalist during the Iraq war. He'd love to talk to you. And so we sort of sat down. Uh, you know, I was a little bit disingenuous, like pretending to be just a journalist. And we got about like an hour into the conversation. Like we were having like a really good rapport. I sort of said to him like, hey, listen, I got to come clean. Like I was also a Marine and I really wanted to meet you. And he kind of laughed and said like, yeah, I thought that was probably the case. So we wound up having this big conversation just sort of, you know, I think there was this really shared curiosity. We both had this experience in the wars that had totally defined us. And the huge question mark is like, who is this person you were fighting against who defined you? You know, it's like what I say in the book is like, it's like being in a shadow dance, you know, like you're dan you're dancing with someone, you can feel them move against you and you move against them, but you never see them, you know, and sort of at the end, like you want to, you want to see them, see who they are and like ask them, you know, I, I had that curiosity and my bet by meeting with Abu Sar was like my gamble was when I tell this guy I was a Marine, he's not going to like get all upset about the politics. He's going to be like, yeah, you know, I'm curious about you too. And let's have a talk. And that's what wound up happening. We became friends. Can you describe, it's, it's great in the book. Like I, I highly recommend it. Can you describe the napkin and, and what you two were doing? Cause, and I think he wasn't, he didn't speak English, right? Like it was going through Abed for translation. Yeah. So it wound up, so what wound up happening is a certain point, like we're, you know, we're, we're talking and like, we're getting very into it. Um, and, um, and we're like basically sitting like at a pic, almost like a picnic table in this cafe. And Abed is translating the whole time and everybody's like, you know, we're drinking lots of tea and we're smoking lots of cigarettes. And I think the first time we talked for about five hours and um, I don't know, like hour, like three and a half. Abed's like, well, first of all, one thing that happened that was interesting was I could see how we would talk and then Abu Asar would, you know, at times kind of go off into the, and I write about it, into these sort of tangents about his sort of, you know, his Islamic vision of, you know, what will happen at the end of days battle in Dabiq, and the prophet has, you know, he's predicted all of this. And, you know, I'm taking my journalistic notes, but like, you know, at certain points, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not writing this down. Like, and I can see how Abed is translating all of this. And I can see how Abed is kind of getting frustrated. Like, oh, he says there will be the end of days battle and the Armageddon is coming and this stuff. And, um, <laughs> And I'm like, you know, it's sort of, frankly, like really at that moment, seeing Abed's body language, I'm like, you know, if I am in some ways framed as having been antagonistic to Abu Hassar, the person who's really his antagonist too is Abed. You know, Abed is this like highly educated, erudite, Syrian democratic activist. And he is watching in 2013, his entire revolution and country go completely in the toilet because of the rise of these Islamists embodied in Abu Hassar and this ideology he's espousing. And so, and that kind of makes like a strange connection between Abed and I, because we're both sort of, you know, we're both sort of like veterans of this war against Abu Hassar. So anyways, he's translating, he's translating, he's translating. At a certain point, Abed's finally like, guys, like I gotta go, I gotta go take a leak. You know, <laughs> like, I mean, this is it's a lot of tea, a lot of thoughts. And um, he leaves. And like as intensely as we've been, Abu Hassar and I have been talking, um, suddenly like we have no one to translate. And it's like we're as awkward as like two 13 year olds on like a first date, you know, like he's kind of looking at his hands and I'm looking at his hands and Abed's gone. But we had this sort of like, I had sketched out this like very kind of rudimentary map of the Iraqi Syrian border. And so um, he takes the map and he writes a place, the name of a place on it. And then he puts a number next to the place and he kind of hands me the pen. And I'm like, I didn't get it at first. I'm like, oh, wait, I get it. And I put a number next to his number. And he does the same thing, another you know, name of place, another number. Then I put my number next to his number. And so sort of as, you know, like as we once kind of chased each other around Iraq, our hands are kind of chasing each other around the map because, you know, the names of the place names, obviously, and the numbers were the dates that we'd been there. And we wanted to see if we'd been at the same place at the same time fighting against each other. And so I write about in the book that what, again, occurred to me at that time. So as much as Abed and I had this connection that we both sort of been like ideologically disenfranchised by Abu Hassar and fought against so many of the things he embodied, Abu Hassar and I were also very much tethered together because we were tethered together through this shared language of places and names and dates 
And that was a language that even if Abed had been there sitting next to us, he couldn't have translated. Um, that was our language alone. Yeah. God, is it safe to say, Elliot, that you like you had respect for him? Yeah, totally. You know, I mean, you know, I don't agree with his ideology. You know, I don't think there's going to be an end of days battle at Dabiq. You know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm not, I'm not too into like fundamentalist Islam, but you know, he's not into democracy. So I mean, listen, yeah. it's like, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you gotta, you can either try to see someone's humanity, or you decide that you don't ever want to see it again. And uh, yeah. I wanted to see his and he wanted to see mine. And, you know, we left everything else kind of on the table. God, you say it so nonchalantly, but like you got a Marine, former CIA <laughs> paramilitary guy going up against an AQ fighter. That's really special, just especially the way you describe it. There's there's something else he says that I, and it, it nests with some of the other things you talk about in the book, Elliot. So he says, when I was first in the jihad, I was a strong man, a starving man, feasting on the action. When I got older, I had to eat more slowly, you know, just like a really interesting way of putting it. And you kind of talk about this as well, like almost the the naivete early on. And then the older you get, the more you see this, the more you see the world and what's happening, how it, how it kind of changes perspective. And so I want to jump. There's a part where you're, I think you're with Vince. You describe him, uh, another vet. He's in Turkey. And you ask, like, why are you here in Turkey? And he says to be close to it. And so I was wondering if you could talk about it, because I feel like Abu Hassar probably has it and a lot of vets out there know it too. Yeah, well, Vince is sort of, I mean, I lived in Istanbul for a number of years and particularly around the Syrian Civil War. I mean, there were lots of expats. There's a very big expat scene there, you know, many of whom like, you you know, you pick the service a little bit. And it's like, oh, you were in Iraq. Oh, you were in Afghanistan. Oh, I get you. Why are you here? I'm a photographer. I'm a writer. I'm like, you know, oh, you're here to cover the war, do something related to the war. Or, you know, I work for an NGO. And so Vince was this sort of, uh, you know, just sort of like a far out Marine I knew, uh, bumped into, who was like teaching English in Turkey. He had like this amazing story of he was in a uh, creative writing class uh, in college uh, outside of Chicago after he got out of the Marine Corps. And he'd been like very active online, sort of following what was going on in the Arab Spring. And he made like some Twitter friends who were from Cairo. And literally like when the Arab Spring popped on like a Wednesday, he like, he found out there was gonna be a huge protest in Cairo on like a Wednesday on a whim, he bought a ticket to Cairo, lands like Thursday morning, goes to the protest like Friday, gets thrown in Egyptian prison on Saturday, gets evac by the State Department on Sunday, and it's like back in his creative writing class the next week. You know, he, he's, you know, he's just, he's just, he's sort of like a roaming, but like, so he and I were having all these conversations about like his story, how he wound up there. Um, He'd been in like the 6th Marine Regiment. Um, and I kind of, yeah, I sort of said to him, I was like, you know, why are you here? Like teaching English? Like, do you really love teaching English that much? And he's like, no, I want to, you know, I want to, oh man, I want to be close to it. And so he said that, you know, and I was like, okay, but I was like, you know, what's the, what is the it, you know? Um, and I mentioned in the book, I think it's like, it's an experience that's like so large that you sort of shrink to insignificance when you're close to that experience. Uh, and it's dangerous because that's how you get lost in it, you know, how you vanish, how people kind of just never come back. Um, so, um, so yeah, so I think, I think probably, you know, a lot of that's, and I certainly identify with this, you know, this, 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 this sense where, you know, you know, I definitely felt it like in Fallujah and I felt it at times in Afghanistan and I felt it at times covering Syria where you're like, man, I am just like, I'm, the world is like opening on a hinge everything's changing on like a hinge or a fulcrum and I'm like standing right there and I'm watching it all. Um, and it's very seductive. Have, have you lost the desire to be where it is by now? Well, it's different. It sort of evolves. Um, your sense of it evolves in new ways. You know, that sense of feeling full. I would say I, um, I get that sense of, cause I would, I would tether, you know, being close to it with something else, which is having a purpose. And um, so I would say, has my desire to have a purpose in some way diminished over the years? No, I should say if anything, it's become stronger. But I would say the sources that I go to to derive that purpose have changed in certain ways. And um, I wouldn't say mature so much as I would just say have evolved you know, um, they're just 
you know, they're, you know, they're different when you're, I mean, I'm in my early forties. They're different when they're in their early forties and when you're like 24. Um, right. So, uh, yeah. And, and you, you describe kind of the most insidious form of PTSD is this purposelessness associated with giving up the war. Um, so I, I might ask, like, if somebody were to say, hey, what's your purpose now, Elliot? Do you have something there that you've found now as in your early 40s? Yeah, I, uh, I'm a father, a husband, and a writer. You know, that's what I drive my purpose yeah. from now. Uh, it took a lot of work to to, you know, to get on that path where I'm doing those things and I'm doing them at a level that I feel satisfied with and they're working for me. Um, but I have, I have repurposed myself. And I think that what a lot, what I have seen amongst my contemporaries, the ones that have sort of left the service and left that life and done well, have been the ones who've been able to kind of successfully repurpose. And the ones I've seen have really struggled have been the ones who haven't really been able to repurpose. They haven't been able to find what that, you know, what Fitzgerald calls, right, that second act in American life. You know, he says in America, in American life, there are no second acts. But what's your kind of, what's your second act? Um, and, um, and it's hard. I mean, listen, it was hard, it was hard for me. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think that's a form of, you know, in popular consciousness, you talk about PTSD. And I think people immediately assume it's like you had some experience where, you know, you saw your best friend blown to smithereens in front of you and it, you know, and their, their ghost is constantly reappearing in your field of vision. And like, and listen, like there's certainly stuff like that that exists and, you know, nightmares and, and that's a real thing. And I would argue there's this much sort of larger and because it's so large and so prevalent, it almost makes it more insidiousness. What makes it more insidious is just this sort of purposelessness that people feel after having these intensely purposeful experiences at a very young age. Yeah. Oh, it's so true. So I got just one more question on places and names, and then we'll talk 2034 here. Um, you go back to Fallujah, right? Like you're one of the very few who goes back as a civilian, basically, to the place where it all happened. Can you just talk about what that felt like to you? And was there any closure that came along with it? Yeah. Um, so I wanted to go back <clears> or <throat> the way I, the way I started going back and how it all happened was, um, uh, I was living in Istanbul and the New York times Istanbul bureau chief was, he was the Istanbul slash Baghdad bureau chief, uh, great journalist. His name's Tim Arango. He's still at the times he's on domestic beat now, but we were having dinner one night and he had just come back from the third battle of Fallujah, which the Iraqis had fought on their own against, uh, the Islamic state. And we were sort of talking about it and, oh man, what was it like? And, da, da, da. and I kind of wistfully said, man, I'd love to go back. And he was just like, why don't you come back? Like, that's not hard. Like, I'll be back there next month and we can just, you know, we'll get you in there and, you know, just come stay at the house in Baghdad. We'll drive over, you know, it's like a, you know, it's like a 45 minute drive. And one thing that's funny is when you're there in the military, your sense of geography, because you're doing everything on military transport, it's like, it's so, you know, to go from Baghdad to Fallujah is like, you know, going halfway across the globe. It's like such a, you know, such a process, but you know, you're like, no, in reality it is like, actually it is a 45 minute drive. It's not that long. Um, I mean, same for me working as a journalist, you know, I'd like, you know, land in Istanbul and get a flight to Gaziantep, but I could be in, you know, I could, I could be in New York city on a Thursday afternoon and be in Syria on a Friday, you know, on a Saturday morning. Uh, and so, but anyways, he said, do you want to go back? So I said, sure. We set the whole thing up and then just sort of by coincidence, like the day I was flying in, the Mosul offensive launched. And he's like, hey, man, I'm really sorry. Like, I'm not going to be in Baghdad. I'm going to be in Erbil going to Mosul. I know you're coming in. You know, you're welcome to stay at the house, but I'm taking all my fixtures with us. I fortunately had through a friend of a friend, a, a name of one other like kind of a backup fixer. And he and I met at the airport. And we sort of kind of wound up talking our way through all of these checkpoints to get into Fallujah. Um, I, you know, I, in my mind, I wanted to go stand on this rooftop where a friend of mine had been killed um, uh, in the government center, which is sort of a compound right in the middle of Fallujah, uh, which we are, my infantry company had like seized on the first day of the battle. That was like our first really big initial objective was, you know, you guys are going to seize the government center and we were hurt for it and all this stuff. So he wound up getting killed on the rooftop that first day of the battle. Um, and so uh, we got down there 
and it turned out the Islamic State, because it had been a government center, had destroyed all the buildings. So there was just rubble there. There's nothing left. So I couldn't stand on the rooftop. But um, I would say one of the things, just from a practical point of view, um, that was complicated um, was, again, like with Abu Hassar, I didn't want to be telegraphing, hey, there's an old Marine who fought in the second battle who wants to, like, come look around, Fallujah citizens. I'm sure you won't have any issues or complicated emotions about this. Uh, you know, I think I write in that piece, it's sort of like showing up in New Orleans if your name is Hurricane Katrina, you know, like you, you might not yeah. be welcome with open arms. So the the police we were working with who were like were frankly kind enough to show us around were sort of like, I'd be like, hey, there's this one rubble building I really want to go see, or there's just one spot. I wanted to go to this one house where our platoon had been surrounded for a day, you know, and there's this little candy store. And I was like, I want to go to that. And I was showing them, the, and they're like, why do you want to go there? Like they couldn't, and then they, and then they figured it out and they're like, wait a second, wait, I, wait a second. And they were like, oh, you are, you must've been here before. Um, and that was sort of, I think, interesting seeing their reactions uh, when they figured out, you know, that, that, that there was sort of a, uh, that there was a, you know, a personal motivation uh, behind taking this journey. Um, so yeah, it was interesting to go back. I think one of the things that I, I mentioned this in the piece that was the most striking to me um, was how little it had changed. Like I, I got to some places where I've been before and I looked, like I remember at one point I, I, I found that candy store and um, and I was looking out from some of the vantages. We spent a whole day penned down there. So you can imagine I'm like just looking at the same little narrow view all day. And I went to that narrow view and I looked at it and I saw this pile, this very kind of low rubble, semi rubble cinder block wall. And it was still there. A decade later, just this little pile of rubble, it hadn't moved, a whole nother battle had swept through there. And the, and and it's because this little pile of rubble, I had wound up like crouching behind it for like 45 minutes with my radio operator, because that was sort of all that was between us and the almighty. And it was still just sitting there, you know, this, this little bit of destruction in the city. God. Yeah, that's why this is a national bestseller. It's a great book, Elliot. Um, so let's let's jump then to 2034, right? So that's the most recent book. Um, not that this matters a ton, but my family happens to love it. So that's my next book here. It doesn't matter a ton. Don't think. Oh no, it's great. Yeah, no, that we're we're all huge fans. What you write in Wired and different pieces, we all we check out. So Places and Names was great. Let's talk 2034. If you can share uh, a bit more, like why this book why now what was it like writing it um so 2034 is a work of speculative fiction um set in that aforementioned year uh and it imagines what what it would look like if the u.s and china went to war mainly at sea and um it's a book that uh i co-wrote with uh, admiral james devridis who is uh uh, retired as the uh, former Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, so the head of NATO. Uh, and he and I actually have known each other for the better part of a decade. We're both graduates of the Fletcher School, where he, uh, when he retired, he went to be the dean there for six years. And when he was dean, he invited me to be the writer in residence for a semester. So I, when he emailed me and said, hey, you want to be the writer in residence? Says, you know, what are my duties? And he kind of gave me a bullet point list. And one of the bullet points was, you know, talk with the dean about books when he feels like it. And so he's like this deeply, he's a very deeply read guy. Like, he, you know, he, I'm, I'm always asking him for like great fiction recommendations. And so I really, we knew each other's sensibilities. And coincidentally, we share an editor at Penguin Press um, just by coincidence. And so he originally had the idea for the book, the idea being that, you know, if you look back at the Cold War, there's this really rich body of literature. Um, looks like the Bedford incident uh, on the beach, um, fail safe films like Dr. Strange Love, even Red Dawn, a favorite of mine, um, where we like imagine what the Third World War would look like. And I think many people would say now, you know, with regards to China, if we're not in a Cold War with China, we're like in the foothills of a Cold War with China. And there's basically nothing written uh, in that type of, you know, body of speculative literature. So, um, so that's sort of his idea. Uh, our shared editors, like, well, you know, if you're going to do this, you should work with a novelist. And like, aren't you and Elliot friends? And so we figured we team up and write the book. And the book is very much kind of this, um, you know, it's a character-based book. I think it moves pretty quickly. It's not a huge techno door stopper. Um, there are five central characters, a, um, a female Navy Commodore, a uh, Marine, a uh, fourth generation fighter pilot, a Chinese Admiral, a veteran of the Iranian Quds Force, and a, uh, 
Indian American national security staffer. And there are many other characters too, but through those five, you kind of, you, you're, you go into the world of 2034 kind of through their eyes and you experience this war through their eyes. And there's a variety of national viewpoints there. And when each one of them steps onto the page, uh, you kind of hear, you know, they're making their case to you, the reader, as though they're making their case before God as to how they see the world uh, in this conflict playing out. So, um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's also kind of, frankly, although it's on a very like, you know, grim topic, you know, global war, I actually think it's a pretty fun read. So. You, you kind of look, you, you have like a good smile as you're talking about it. It looked like it was a lot of fun to write, actually. I don't know if that's true. But. Yeah, we had a blast writing it. It was a lot of fun to write. Oh, that's awesome. All right. So I'm going to let you go. I just had one other thing. Um, do people, like, you seem like a modern day Hemingway. And I, I mean, I don't mean to be crazy here, but like the, the type of combat you saw and what you write about and the places you've been, do people talk about that with you? I don't know. Well, you know, Hemingway got blown up delivering chocolates to the front line. So I like, I, like, I did better than Hemingway. Right. <laughs> at, least, at least in that regard, I wasn't delivering anybody chocolates. Fair enough. I, 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 listen, I, that's a huge compliment. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Now, Elliot, it's always fun. Um, thanks so much for round two. I'm sure there'll be a round three one day. Um, and where can people find you online? Yeah, um, well, first of all, thank you. And I'd love to do that. You can find me online at uh, ElliotAckerman.com. And uh, same thing on like Twitter and Facebook. And uh, my books are wherever good books are sold, but it's been a tough year for independent bookstores. So try to support your local indie. Thanks so much, man. Yeah. Take care. I hope you enjoyed this combat story. People often write to me with incredible stories and suggestions for interviews. If you want to share a combat story of your own or from someone you served with, record yourself for up to five minutes and email it to ryan at combatstory.com. I'll select some of these stories and feature them at the end of our episodes. Thanks for listening. Stay safe.